Oh, there we are. I can turn my glasses off. I can't see, so it's all perfect. Um, good. Did I send you a copy of the record, or did somebody? Yes. So you've heard it. I have heard it. Yeah, I think it's great. Okay. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank. You. I would. I would say it's one of your best. Um, thank you. People generally are being uh, happy with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's called Shuffle Mania. I, I noticed it's not up on Spotify. I was wondering if you're no longer uh, releasing new material on that platform. It won't be on Spotify for another month. Um, we, the, the tiny ghost policy is to put things up on streaming after initial sales have gone so that to begin with, if you want to hear it, you have to buy it. Um, just to be old fashioned, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't use streaming services at all. Um, Emma, who runs Tiny Ghost, my wife, she uh, she put her record out two years ago, her first full length album, Blonde on the Tracks, which was the first proper Tiny Ghost album release. Mm -hmm. And um, she kept that off streaming for a few months. So that's generally our policy. I see. So uh, your father was a novelist, and um, I, I really don't know how how famous he was, but uh, did you feel like you were being raised by a celebrity? Oh, not at all. He wasn't at all famous. He was even less well known than I am. Oh, he was. Um, he was a man in transition, you know, he started out as a soldier, was wounded in World War II, so he couldn't bend his right leg for the last nearly 50 years of his life. Um, and then he went to, went to university after the war and became a, a communications engineer, an engineer, a technical man. Uh, I would never have understood what he did, and he wouldn't have been able to explain it to me. He could have been a spy for all I knew. And then he, um, then he became a cartoonist, and then a painter, and then an author. And he had more luck being an author than anything else. But you know, he sold a few books and plays and a couple of TV scripts, and he had one book made into his first novel was made into a movie and that was the thing that brought him most money and most profile um a, a novel about a man who has a penis transplant and tries to find the donor so it was sort of marketed as a sex comedy which it wasn't really but um my dad was definitely interested in the kind of the comic side of the erotic Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe in a particularly English way, I don't know, but I'm sure I've inherited a fair bit of that. Uh, but I went into music, I think probably maybe unconsciously so I wouldn't compete with him because although I do write and draw and paint, um, my main gig is as a musician and Raymond never touched an instrument and was you know, self-confessedly tone deaf, so he couldn't sing. Huh. So in no way was I competing with my father. <laughs> but you have written some short stories. I've tried, but I, I'm, in fact, the more I've tried to write short stories, the more I know that, that that's not for me. I, I can make things work for like, that's why I'm a songwriter or a poet, you know, I'm great for, four or five verses, <laughs> but uh, over any length of time, it, it, what I do is <clears throat> maybe too saturated, um, too kind of dense to make sense as a story, or maybe I can't create characters that um, the reader can empathize with or whatever. My dad was, he was basically an ideas man mm -hmm. who, I put a lot of ideas. He's got, there's, there's a whole trunks full of unpublished manuscripts. He may have had like 
six or seven books published in his lifetime and there's probably 10 times that lying around you know moldering they'll they probably will be thrown away or burned when my sisters and I pass on um you know he wrote about he wrote three novels about Stonehenge I think and none of them came to anything he wrote quite a few about William Rufus the 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 son of William the Conqueror. He had certain fixations in time, you know. I noticed that he wrote a book called Venus 13 and you have you had a band called Venus 3. Yeah, that was the nod to him. It was Scott McCoy's band, the Minus Five, but actually there were only three of them. So I called them the Minus Three for a bit. And then I looked at the name without my glasses and it looked like Venus. So I thought, yeah, let's make it the Venus three, which is a, a nod to Raymond and, and Venus 13. Yeah. Okay. I noticed that, I mean, I, I pretty much know who your musical influences are, but what about your literary influences? Well, my literary influences um, are sort of kind of chronologically, I suppose, J.G. Ballard and H.G. Wells, who were both kind of classified as science fiction, but were something else really. You know, they were imaginative short stories that came from a knowledge of what science, where human knowledge and technical know-how and thinking was going, but they, I don't know. It's a bit like comedy, you know. Was Monty Python comedy? Is Lewis Ch Lewis Carroll a children's author? And you know, <laughs> did J.G. Ballard write science fiction? But but um, Ballard and and H.G. Wells. H.G. Wells wrote the Time Machine, most famously. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Have you read it? Have you read H.G. Wells stuff or, or Ballard? Probably, stuff? but I can't really say for sure. Okay, well, H.G. Wells wrote particularly around, you know, the, the end of the Victorian era, the beginning of the Edwardian, so like 120 years ago. So it, it was it's all in an era which would now almost be steampunk to us. Um, you know, lots of brass knobs and handles and pipes and um, sort of, you know, wooden chests and levers and dials and all that kind of stuff and the first electricity and the very very early telephones but you know I don't think there were even aeroplanes when he started and um but he wrote a very vivid book about a time traveler a man who you know he's a Victorian a breathless Victorian gentleman who invites some friends to supper and and shows them this brass contraption he's got in his front room covered with knobs and dials and levers and and he tells them about how he's made journeys into the future and it you know been at the end of humanity and what comes beyond humanity and uh oh god it's fascinating i mean i read that when i was like 10 or 11 that went in very deep and ballard wrote um a lot of Oh, just all sorts of possible situations, but they weren't all kind of like other worlds or anything, you know. There weren't really any aliens in Ballard's world. They were just more unusual processes of thought. So that that was that was a really big influence on me. And then people like Mervyn Peake. You ever read him? Never heard of him. M-E-R-V-Y-N-P-E-A-K-E. <coughs> uh, -E Mervyn Peake wrote the Gormenghast trilogy. You'll have to look up how to spell that. <laughs> but but um, Gormenghast uh, was a sort of fictitious English type castle in a forest somewhere that was very, very, it's like a cross between a sort of boarding school and a royal family and um, sort of medieval Victorian 
place, but they had electricity and gas lamps and horses and it, it's not set in any particular time. And that was his main, he did, there were three books of Titus, uh, Titus, um, Titus alone and Gorman Garst and they, oh, it's really hard to describe briefly, but again, they were quite popular in the, in the sort of hippie era. So I got into Gorman Garst more when I was 17 or 18 into Mervyn Peake. He was also a really good illustrator, a brilliant, he made, you know, he, he made his living actually by teaching art and by illustrating other people's work. He did some illustrations of Lewis Carroll. Um, and he had a sort of premature breakdown when he was only in his 40s, I think after having to go to Auschwitz and do some drawings. He was a very sensitive man and it didn't really, army life didn't suit him and going into a concentration camp suited him even less. And he, he kind of just, a bit like Captain Beefheart, he went off into some strange sort of premature senility. Um, but those sorts of people, you know, Peak, Ballard, Wells, really went into my, went right into my hypothalamus, um, you know, along, along with sort of similar artists, musicians like Captain Beefheart and Sid Barrett. And of course, I love Dylan and the Beatles, like, you know, millions of mainstream folks, but... Mm -hmm. That was my particular brew of influences, I suppose. Okay. Father. Well, thank you. Um, you did a bit of acting back in the knots, I believe. Not really. I what I did was I did. Um, this was Jonathan Demi, the late film director, who mm -hmm. who is best known for um, Silence of the Lambs and and then some great movies. He tried never to make the same movie twice, he said. And he, um, but he was also a big music fan. So he did Stop Making Sense for Talking Heads, which is his most famous movie, music movie. But he also uh, worked with Neil Young and um, uh, God, The Feelies. I think he did The Feelies and he did, um, he did stuff for people like UB40, but he, he made an in-concert movie of me in New York in a, in a shop window in 1996. And Storefront Hitchcock. Storefront Hitchcock. And he kind of, he liked to, he sort of collected people. He was a big, if, if he liked you, he sort of kept you on his books, you know. And I was very lucky. So when he was doing a remake of The Manchurian Candidate, a few years later, he got me in to be a kind of secondary British villain. Um, and I said, well, it's nice of you. I'm not really an actor. And he said, it's all performance. He said, the camera loves you, buddy. So, you know, I was very grateful and it, and it was it helped me out financially um, at the time too. So I did that. And then I was in another one he did called Rachel Getting Married, which had Anne Hathaway in it. Yes, I saw that. She was great. That was a, that was a much lower budget production. I think he didn't really like having to deal with the big studios. And there was an, the, the big studios, you know, they might still have been working on film in those days. Everything was just expensive. You know, they'd fly you around first class and put you up in nice hotels, and get you up at five in the morning so you could sit around in your trailer all day and then say two lines. You know, it was very, very lush. Mm -hmm. uh, I enjoyed the life, but uh, Rachel getting married was much cheaper. I think they funded that themselves, and it was a hit, which was great. And I, I yes, one of his one of his later kind of drama movies. But he he also did a lot of filming down in in New Orleans um, after her, after Katrina went through in Ward Nine, I think it is. Um, you know, so he'd, he'd go down just by himself and talk to people. He he liked people. That was the thing with Jonathan. Didn't take him. Hello? 
Oh, there you are. Okay. Sorry about that. Oh, you're much lighter. Yeah, I'm sitting in front of a window now. Okay, right. That's good. Are you still there? Okay, then I am too. All right. So, uh, you were. You, do you want to finish that thought, Jonathan Demi? Yes. Oh, whatever I said. Yeah, he 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 liked people. He didn't always take them too seriously, but he he did like them. All right. Um, you lived in Nashville for a while, I believe. What uh, what motivated you to move there? Well, I'm still partly there, actually. Um, uh, why were we in Nashville? Why are we in Nashville? I'm going back there tomorrow. Um, well, it's a music it's a music place. You know, it's a great place to be as a musician. And yeah. um, when I got together with Emma she was she's australian but she was in nashville already and then we we scuttled around the planet for a while lurching between the isle of wight and australia and all sorts of places and uh, wound up actually getting a place in nashville which we we still have um and doing a fair amount of recording there uh, I made my last two records there. Um, I mean, Brendan Benson's there. He produced my last record and he's on, he's playing on two songs on Shuffle Mania. He's on the Sir Tommy Shuffle and on the first track, The Shuffle Man. Um, Gillian Welch and Dave Rawlings are there and they're just down the road from us. Um, they, I, they played with me and recorded a, an album I did called Spooked uh, in fact, yes. while I was working on the Manchurian Candidate with, um, the, which was Jonathan Demi and everybody. In some downtime, I came down to Nashville and we recorded a lot of Spooked in a weekend. So we went back and did the rest of it. That wasn't planned. Um, so there was, you know, there's Gillian and David and then Brendan Benson who got in touch with me before I even thought of moving out there. Emma had friends in Nashville. Um, Grant Lee Phillips, do you know of him? Grant I do. Lee, fame. Grant moved over there about the same time we did. Um, and uh, Sean Nelson's moved there now. Um, yeah, just there were just you know enough people that were in my orbit uh, to to make sense for me to be there, and then I met some really terrific players who who've been on. Uh, they were on my 1917, 2017 record, and um, uh, whatever else it was called, um, the, the most recent one, Shuffle Man. Yeah, Shuffle Man. <laughs> Right. Yeah. So you've got some pretty well-known musicians playing on that, like Johnny Marr and Sean Lennon, I think. Yes. Well, Brendan's on it too. Patrick Sansone from Wilco. He was a neighbor. Um, uh, he did a lot of, on it, actually. Um, a lot of the songs went to him first, then they went somewhere else. Well, that was the thing you know, you couldn't see anybody physically. So it was the reverse of when I made the, the self-titled record um, three years, four years earlier, whenever I made it. Um, I couldn't see a soul, but I could send them things through email. So the whole record was done postally. I just recorded the, the vocals and the basic guitar and then I'd send them off to people then they'd send them back to me then I might redo my voice or play some extra guitar but you know the the core tracks were all done at, at home um in East Nashville so it, it's essentially a Nashville record I think we finished it here I did I did one I did a little bit a session at Abbey Road just uh -huh. for she contrast we were able to get into abbey road although we all had to wear masks and stand a long way away from the engineers but we it was between lockdowns in london so you could kind of get around and then everything shut down again 
Uh, all right. Well, uh, I wanted to ask you uh, to what extent your music is informed by psychedelics. Psychedelic drugs? Yes. Very much by proxy. Another author that I was influenced by was Aldous Huxley, who, as you know, wrote, you know, The yes. Doors of Perception, um, which I, I totally absorbed that when I was about 14, 15. And um, that whole thing of kind of, you know, seeing heaven in your trousers and all the rest of it, just, that was a very key way of thinking. So, you know, I'd, I'd listen to, the people I listened to in a way took all the drugs for me. I mean, particularly, well, all the greats really, you know, the Beatles, Bob Dylan, Sid Barrett, Captain Beefheart, Lou Reed took different drugs maybe, but, you know, pretty much all of them, there was, Nobody, nobody I listened to had not got very high on a whole variety of drugs, and most of them had quite a, a come down afterwards. So to me, drugs like alcohol are, are really, you know, you're mortgaging tomorrow by having it today. So my God, this is fantastic. And then you may go into a deep depression afterwards. Um, some people are more buoyant and they can survive repeated doses and repeated trips and other people can't. I was very cagey about taking LSD, so I didn't even take it until uh, 1971. I was, I was an old man of 18. So, um, and I maybe took it six, or seven times over the course of the 70s. Mm -hmm. um, not regularly at all. And I, I did find things very funny sometimes when I was going up. I do remember laughing hysterically at some fried eggs. And, uh, you know, the whole euphoria thing, just mm -hmm. as the, you know, the, there's a point in your, with certainly, grass, marijuana, the kind of stuff that we smoked 50 years ago anyway, where you did get the giggles and it was fantastic, but then you were left feeling hungry and paranoid. Um, so, I don't, you know, it, it was something you had to do, especially back then, you know. There was it was no, almost mandatory for musicians was, to take LSD. Mandatory just for a young groover, you know to a young person to at least smoke pot and drop a little bit of acid and then you might go into other things. But um, actually what I enjoyed most was mescaline, organic mescaline, ever had that? No. Oh, well, that's what Aldous Huckley took. It was a, a white powder and um, I only took it maybe three or four times, but it was, much gentler than LSD. It wasn't cut with amphetamine, so it was a, a sort of gradual kind of high, I suppose. And it was great for listening to the incredible string band on and sort of, I don't know, looking at drops of water or <laughs> leaves, the natural world. Um, you know, there was a big emphasis on, oh, you've got to find the right kind of place. Um, the ritualistic element to taking psychedelics, you know, you, you weren't just supposed to kind of walk down Oxford Street and drop a tab, you know, and go into a pub or something. You, you, you went to go and be with some sympathetic people in a some place where there wasn't a, a sensory overload and you could sort of gradually let things come to you. But even if you did that, you could get pretty freaked out afterwards. I never had a bad trip, but I wasn't usually left feeling much better for it. And a hmm. couple of cases I felt actually quite burned out. 
I remember my handwriting changed. <laughs> um, uh... Sorry, if that's, if that's not me. Is it me? I don't know. It might be Emma's. It's probably Emma's phone. It'll, sorry, it'll go. Well, <laughs> okay, there we go. The magic of. Um, you know, these are these are all miracles undreamt of in 1970. Um, are you still there? I'm still here. Oh, great. Okay. Now, now, now there's just me on the screen for some reason. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Did you take a lot? Well, I, I, yeah, I'm fairly experienced with them. Yes. Did you take peyote? No, no. Pretty much just LSD and, and mushrooms. Oh, okay. Because I mean, you're, I don't know if you're in peyote country, but there's all those things like ayahuasca and peyote. Right. Also. Yeah. I think that's a little further south in Mexico. Oh, right. Okay. Well, they, they, you know, I don't fancy them because they make you vomit supposedly. But I feel like if I was to take anything again, it would be to take ritual psychedelics like peyote or or possibly mushrooms in the right circumstances i never really got very far with them but i um the whole thing with drugs is uh, drugs in the inverted commas in which we use them i mean i saw people getting very inspired and then i saw them getting very burned out and i'm also a very active person I don't really like to just sit and stare into space. Um, I used to get stoned, get high and try and write poems or draw, but actually it, it didn't help. It, I, I, I did the, it, it exa marijuana exaggerates the importance of your thoughts so they can become quite overwhelming. And when I tried writing poems on LSD, I remember thinking, well, why write a poem? It's all there in front of you, you know. <laughs> what are you writing about? What are you drawing about? Just look, you know, it's there. And it, and it kind of, I think, maybe acid kind of dwarfed my ego and marijuana kind of expanded it, you know. <laughs> But neither was very good for for um, me as someone who is a compulsive artist and musician. The only thing I did get from from taking LSD was playing electric guitar one evening. I borrowed someone's electric guitar, and and I realised that you could get that what I call the wire between the ears sound. Um, which you hear in things like Interstellar Overdrive by Pink Floyd and um, uh, Eight Miles High, you know, the, the McGuinn 12 string sound. And a little bit in things like um, when the Beatles are being birdsy, things like She Said, She Said, you know. What, what sound are you talking about? I call, I call the wire between the ears sound. It's like, you know, you hit a couple of, notes a couple of e notes and a couple of strings and they just kind of they just jangle they just go between your ears like like a wire <laughs> okay um and i i think i definitely could i saw how that sound it had obviously influenced sid barrett it obviously influenced um Jim McGuinn, um, it obviously influenced George Harrison. It was just that kind of acid spangle noise, you know. Yes. And, uh, but, but I loved it anyway. I liked it before I even took LSD. So LSD just sort of, oh, I see, maybe that's where they got it from, you know. So, yeah. So I really like that way of thinking. And I like that kind of sound but I don't necessarily want to have to take a drug to, to 
channel it to to make it happen or to enjoy it i i sort of feel like music that you have to be high to enjoy i'm not sure about um and um, i think if it's good it can get to you absolutely when your blood is you know pure as a mountain stream um i mean i'm i'm not a purist and i don't i don't lead a that kind of life um, i'm i'm not a whatever the word for it is you know i'm i'm not a sober chaste and sober individual at all but i think in terms of working playing on stage and and um, writing and drawing i i just like to keep a clear head yeah and i think you can still draw from your prior experiences at any given point i can draw and i think of also like people like salvador dali or hieronymus bosch or or um you know Giorgio de Chirico or Max Ernst or um, René Magritte, a lot of the people that the psychedelic folk latched onto, and, and I did as a young, as a you know very young man, but I don't know if any of those guys actually took any drugs. I feel like that's that's there in your subconscious if you know how to access it, and yeah. it's just it's sixties was a period of accessing it and it became important you know same as Jung had been around so the unconscious or the subconscious was was identified and ripe for investigating and and Huxley had been you know Huxley was a very erudite dude and a, and a great novelist and above all a fantastic a real thinker you know and and he latched on to mescaline so you kind of you had to you had to take that stuff. <laughs> yeah. You don't have to well, be... Robin, I'm I'm getting a message that uh, Zoom is about to end the meeting. Is it? Oh dear. Okay. Um. What time is it? Where are we? Six thirty-eight. Uh, your time. Six thirty-eight. Okay. I should be able to do another twenty minutes, but I don't know. Hang on. How to do that? Where are we? Oh no no no! It's Zoom is going to end the meeting in just a couple minutes. So I, I think we need to wrap this up. Oh, okay. Oh, well, that, um, have you got what, have you got enough sort of stuff, basically? I think so. That's fabulous. Well, look, I'm glad we managed to connect. Are you going to yes. edit this into some kind of piece, or is it a Q&A? Yeah, it'll be edited, and I'll send you a link. Oh, that's great. Um, there are photos floating about. Okay. And, um, I will, uh, but I think we've got some on my site if you need them. Okay. I will, I hope I'll get to Tucson um, before too long, maybe maybe next fall. That'd be great. I'd love to meet you in person. See that, please say hi to, give Congress a big kiss from me and, um, and, I'll, and I'll see you there. Okay, thanks so much. Jason, you're welcome. Take care. All right, bye Rob. Okay. Oh.